Today we are gathered this evening uh, to reflect on the state of democratic freedoms during the pandemic in India. Um, our preamble spoke of many freedoms. The freedom of, uh, it promised the freedom of thought, of expression, of belief, of faith, and of worship. Implied here were also the rights to dissent, dissent against power, to form associations, and to peacefully protest against the government. And also, I think, at its foundations, the freedom from fear, the freedom from discrimination. It is perhaps not surprising that a slogan that uh, ran through the 100 days of the anti-CA protests was the word Azadi, which means freedom. Uh, and it rang out in slogan after slogan, uh, alongside the reverential mass reading of the preamble of the Constitution. People spoke everywhere about uh, their resolve to reclaim freedom, freedom from hate, freedom from discrimination, freedom from the politics of division. It was like a burst of, 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 of brilliant light uh, of hope uh, and resistance, probably the largest uh, since the freedom struggle that this country has seen. And then came first the Delhi violence and then the lockdown, the most stringent in the world. Symbolically, uh, perhaps on the first day of the lockdown, we, one of the first acts of the government was to whitewash uh, the, the graffiti uh, on the walls of Jamia, which young student protesters had, had painted. Uh, it, 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 you know, the question really was, what did that have to do uh, with a lockdown in a health emergency. We also saw the very quick uh, and amazing communalization of the pandemic. And shortly after we started seeing numerous detentions, arrests, incarceration, uh, more than 1400 people were arrested, uh, much larger numbers of people were called in. Uh, and all of this was in the middle of a pandemic where uh, they did not have access even to uh, to their lawyers uh, and there was uh, their family members could not go uh, uh, and through this period we've seen the building of a, an entirely alternative narrative about the anti-ca protests uh, and uh, particularly young protesters student protesters uh, uh, people of muslim identity uh, among the young uh, particularly being targeted, and women most of all. Uh, there's clearly a message there, uh, as far as we can see, uh, to criminalize and to, and to crush the possibility of any future dissent. There are also questions that, that are relevant about how democratic was the decision of the long lockdown itself. Uh, who took the decision? Who was consulted? What was the scientific basis of, of that decision? Uh, to have the most stringent lockdown in the world. Even China uh, at its peak uh, uh, locked down 5% of its population. We locked down 100% uh, with four hours notice. Uh, was that a, a, a democratic decision? Uh, who has explained uh, any of, 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 of these decisions? Uh, who has explained uh, the outcomes? Uh, I, I, you know, just as, as an example, uh, we have we had a night curfew for many months. A night curfew in a law and order situation makes sense. A night curfew in a health emergency, could someone, nobody bother to explain, was there some, uh, you know, secret uh, scientific information that they had that the virus suddenly became more deadly in the dark. Uh, and through all of this, uh, where, you know, the suffering of the migrants, the, the burst of mass hunger, all countervailing institutions of democracy seem to have caved in. Uh, there's an enveloping darkness uh, all around of foreboding and of fear. I believe freedom has never been 
as threatened in our republic as it is today. So I turn uh, to my panelists this, this evening uh, with the first of my questions. Uh, the question that I ask is, I believe, and, and, and some people believe that this is a moment in the journey of our republic when freedoms are most under threat. Do you agree? And what do you think are the gravest threats today to freedom in India at this moment? Uh, so no, no uh, uh, fixed order. Maybe Satish, uh, why don't you, would you like to open up uh, with your with your response to this first question. In terms of the gravest threat to freedom today, I think is the fact that large numbers of Indians are feeling that they are free for the first time. That they are free from what they have felt to be false, a false kind of uh, set of values, and they're free to be who they are. Uh, at least this is the sense we are getting uh, from what is all around us. Uh, and I think that that is really the biggest threat to our freedom today, that uh, what some of us are seeing as the throttling of freedoms uh, and the targeting of particular kinds of people is being seen by others as the arrival of a new kind of freedom. And I think we have to be honest enough to face this, face the issue. It's not only um, if we believe in the people, then we must listen to them, even when they are saying things that we do not like. And uh, how do we do that? when our language, the language that people like us speak, seems to have lost almost all its resonance in larger society. Uh, and perhaps people like us are in, are in a moment when all the reasons that perhaps we were conscious of or not conscious of that made people listen to us in whatever way they did before, all those reasons seem to have gone away. So. Uh, I, I see the gravest threat to freedom as the belief of a large number of people uh, in what is happening and their support for it, not just passive support, but active support for it. We can argue about whether it's actually a majority or not and so on, but I think there is a large amount of support for this. And that's the first issue that I feel we have to tackle if we are to face this question. So Satish, uh that's fascinating what is what is the unfreedom uh, that that this set of people believe that they are being freed from uh, could you explain that a little more it's more a feeling harsh i don't think we can uh, understand it in the realm of facts and empirical evidence and things like that it's perceptions it's what people feel um, they they are or what they are persuaded to feel so in, in, a, in, a, in a large sense, politics is always the politics of persuasion. Yeah. And uh, certain kinds of persuasion seem to have acquired a new kind of resonance, uh, an, an, a new, new sense of acceptance uh, among people, uh, while older kinds are uh, losing their effectiveness. So um, when we try to understand what this sense is, uh, I think it is the constant feeding of a sense of victimization or a sense of having been treated unfairly in their own country. Uh, and I'm saying this because this is not true only of India, but we are seeing the same phenomenon elsewhere as well. Uh, groups from what are in every objective sense dominant majorities are suddenly feeling victimized, are suddenly feeling vulnerable and uh, treated unfairly. Uh, and uh, that's what I think we have to address in some fashion. Please, uh, Dr. Ziwa Hassan, uh, coming back again, uh, do you agree that this is a moment in which democratic freedoms are, are deeply perhaps uh, in unprecedented threat and in what ways? I do agree uh, that uh, never before 
have democratic freedoms and democratic rights being under a greater threat. I think the last six years have seen a systematic attack on free speech, persecution of minorities, intimidation of critics, and shrinking press freedom, which should come as a surprise for us, given, given that the press has really been press ganged, so to speak, into supporting uh, the government. And I think some of this has, uh, has gained momentum in the past one year as the government has shifted towards a sharper majoritarian agenda after its second victory uh, in the 2019 elections. And I think there are three clear indications of that. One, the open involvement of the government and the state machinery in the construction of the Ram Temple in Ayodhya, the revocation of Kashmir's uh, special status and statehood, and the continued detention of political leaders in Kashmir one year down the line as we speak. Uh, and of course, uh, the Citizenship Amendment Act, uh, as, as you have, uh, so eloquently uh, spoke about. So the point there is that politically, clearly, the suppression of dissent which includes the criminalization of dissent and declaring dissent as anti-national, curbs on opposition and curbs on protest, crushing of protests. I mean, clearly this poses a grave threat uh, to democracy. And I think what we've seen in the past few months in particular, and ever since these uh, anti-CAA uh, protests, that the regime has used a very heavy-handed approach uh, to put critics and dissenters in their place, which is, as we are often injury. Sedition charges and the UAPA have been very liberally used uh, to arrest prominent intellectuals and advocates of civil liberties, such as those accused of the Bhima uh, Koregao case. And also, it has been so indiscriminately used to arrest young students from Jamia Millia Islamia and the Jawaharlal Nehru University, who so wonderfully led the anti CA protests. But that said, in my assessment, uh, I mean, this is well known, I think the biggest threat uh, to democracy in India comes from the institutional collapse caused by a systematic assault on, as you said, the countervailing institutions of democracy. The independence of the Election Commission of India, the Central Bureau of, uh, of uh, Investigation, the Central Vigilance Commission, the Reserve Bank of India, the right to information has been diluted, Parliament and its standing committees have been uh, severely uh, undermined. And then, on top of that, institutionally, the concentration of power in one person, the checks and balances, uh, of constitutional government have clearly been very significantly weakened. The misuse of police, as we have witnessed in the past uh, three to four months, of the, even after the lockdown, uh, the tax and investigative agencies against the political opposition, constraining very much the opposition from really uh, going forward in opposing uh, this government. Uh, all these are clearly gross violations of the Constitution, which actually put our democracy at uh, risk. I would argue that never before have constitutional institutions have had to function for political ends and in such partisan ways uh, when there's no formal declaration of emergency. Thirdly, I would say the, in, the impartial of what I think has been the most worrying uh, aspect of this institutional collapse is that the impartial functioning of the judiciary has been compromised, which is really the most striking element of this collapse. Over the last six years, we've seen a striking decline in the role of the Supreme Court as being the guardian of the constitution of fundamental rights of citizens and the rule of law. Habeas corpus, the CA, application of Article 370, petitions challenging electoral bonds have been postponed to suit the government. But to me, the biggest indication of uh, the compromisingness, so to speak, of the judiciary is that if the courts can refuse 
to hear habeas corpus when the court's mandate to protect liberty cannot be taken for granted, even though we know that individual freedom is at the very center of the, uh, of the uh, court's mandate. And finally, I think, uh, which is a really, really important part of the story that we are uh, discussing, and that is the mainstream media. I mean, I cannot say enough about uh, the way the media has functioned and the way in which the media has been captured by an establishment outlook. And it has completely abdicated its responsibility of speaking truth to power. I mean, the media has undoubtedly, uh, especially uh, television, uh, television, has night after night asking very tough questions, but only from the opposition and not from the government. Now, this is extraordinary. Uh, when we compare uh, compare our country or our democracy and, the, and democracy and the media, so to speak, with other countries. It's extraordinary because in most uh, democracies, the media is the watchdog of the government. But in India, since the BJP came to power in 2014, the media is the watchdog of the opposition. Now, if we take all of these four elements uh, that I've spoken of, and especially the three elements of the institutional uh, collapse, and I'm sort of including media within that institutional architecture. There is reason for us to really worry about the future of our uh, democracy and obviously the need, uh, and, and, and the need to really strengthen our efforts to safeguard democratic rights. Thank you. Uh, Kiruba, can I come to you next, please? Uh, uh, do you agree that this is a moment of great, perhaps unprecedented darkness uh, in our journey as a republic. Yeah, so uh, I see this pandemic lockdown as the new national emergency because if the government is expecting us to stop from being uh, involved in our normal activities, the government should also stop from amending laws, bringing up new laws, and they should also stop, uh, you know, pass the administrative measures. Whereas citizens were made to, uh, you know, uh, uh, stay away from their day-to-day -day activities, whereas the government was keep on going on with its activity itself is more undemocratic in a, um, you know, in the present circumstances. And apart from talking about the arrest of uh, Hani Babu and uh, Northeast activist uh, Lai Chumba and also non, not releasing uh, women, uh, female activists, CEA activists like Devangana, Natasha, Gulfisha, there were uh, more important legal amendments that were made in the labor laws, which is, uh, you know, uh, missed from the um, discussions on the social media. So in the May 2020, there were a protest of labor unions and they couldn't gather in, ma in mass numbers because of the lockdown. And uh, the protest was uh, against the amendment to the a labor loss which was brought by Yogi Adityanath led the UP government, uh, which made defunct all the laws like Minimum Wages Act and also Industrial Defense Act and Industrial Relations Act. And followed by the UP government, the Rajasthan government also uh, increased the threshold of layoffs uh, to 300 from 100. And the uh, um, uh, working hours and the overtime and uh, uh, you know other uh, uh, hours regulate, uh, re regulatories were overlooked and the amendment laws actually allows uh, an employee to work from eight hour shift to 72 hour shift straight and there is no break that could be um, you know availed by the employee and also apart from the 72 hours there is also another uh, amendment proposed that if a woman is uh, taking a maternity break for six, six months with paid leave, she can come to the work immediately uh, within a week if she wishes. So this, though this term is seen as if the woman feels better and she could come to work, there are chances that all the private organizations or even uh, corporations could um, you know, force those women to come back immediately from the maternity leave which affects women's labor rights as well. And since the Industrial Disputes Act 1947 was relaxed and the uh, Industrial Relations Act 1960 was suspended, it allows 
uh, for a demolition of entire labor rights tribunal and labor officers will not have any power uh, hereafter and the labor unions will not have any meaning at all. So if this had happened in a normal course, there would have been a national, nationwide protest, but because of this lockdown, the entire protest was uh, in a way you know, crushed. And also, apart from um, this labor loss, the EEA, Environment uh, Impact Assessment Notification, and also National Education Policy. So when the government says it is actually fighting the COVID-19 and pandemic struck and the government is not able to uh, make any progress for the welfare of the citizens, why would the government introduce such national emergency policy, uh, education policy and the environment assessment uh, policies in the time of uh, pandemic uh, COVID-19 situation. And because of this, I think all the labor laws amendment and the EAA introduction or the NEP uh, policy cannot be seen uh, in an isolated manner. Everything is clubbed together. So in one way, they are giving permission to all factories, all industries through environmental impact assessment uh, notification. On the other hand, they are allowing students from grade six to grade eight to undergo vocational trainings. And they are also mandating a 10 days bagless period uh, in which uh, students from sixth class to 10th class could go to a carpenter and electrician gardener and they can learn all the vocational skills. And on the other hand, they are relaxing all the labor laws and union rights, trade unions. And so everything is being connected and everything is well planned and it is purposefully um, you know, implemented and notified during the pandemic so that the government makes sure that the citizens cannot come out and they will not protest against any of their uh, initiatives. Come now to uh, Dr. Nandini Sundar. Um, so, uh, Nandini, what, how would you respond to the broad question of uh, the situation of democratic freedoms at this moment? Um. Well, first, Harsh, thanks for organizing this. Um, I agree with all the previous panelists that this is really a moment of grave danger. And, um, but I think one of the reasons why uh, we feel that this is an emergency is um, because middle class people who normally have the protection of either being located in a metropolis or class, et cetera, are being targeted. And that is actually a hallmark of an emergency. If you compare it to the previous emergency, again, that's something that we saw um, then because um, in a way, large portions of our population have been in states of emergency, you know, right from 1947. If you look at the Northeast, you look at Kashmir, uh, you look at the ongoing kind of uh, situation of Dalits and Adivasis, a lot of it um, has been about the denial of freedom. And so the idea that, you know, there was never Asli Azadi uh, is something that we really should uh, take into account. But having said that, I think that, you know, the comparison that is usually made between uh, this period and the earlier emergency um, is important. Uh, precisely for the reason that Satish pointed out, that uh, this is more dangerous because it's not seen as a top-down imposition, uh, but it's something that people are, uh, have internalized the, you know, the degree of consent to what is going on now is much greater than it was then. At least, I mean, it's hard to say because there was a lot of support for that emergency as well, at least on the surface. Um, on the day of, uh, on the 5th of August, um, you know, in my colony, there was this loudspeaker going on opposite the Darga, which, um, you know, apart from the usual, abhi bhagwa dhari, aane wale hai, et cetera, it said, Pulio, uh, uh, Pulo se arti, uh, uh, Golio se arti, you know, and it was just this constant chant about, uh, we are going to demolish more mosques, we are on our way, uh, Pulo se tilak karo, golio se arti. That was the constant refrain. And um, I think that this idea that people are feeling unleashed from the constitution is something that is very serious. Um, now, I'm not clear whether it's a reaction. You know, it's often called, uh, 
say racial resentment or sort of upper caste backlash, white backlash, etc. But in a way, it's also a continuation of an ongoing uh, system of domination, which was briefly checked by the constitution, briefly checked by Nehruvian socialism. And now we are back to that open naked reassertion of Hindu dominance, upper caste dominance. Uh, so I'm not sure, you know, in a historical framework, whether this is um, a moment of greater unfreedom, but regardless, it's a moment where we are certainly unfree, we are certainly facing an emergency, and I think we need to figure out how we're going to counter it. We're not going to be able to use the institutions of the media or the judiciary, as Zoya pointed out. Uh, those are not accessible to us anymore. Uh, we really need to think of avenues now whereby we can actually uh, reach out in a variety of different ways. And um, I don't have answers. I don't think that uh, this is something that you know, will necessarily be one large effort. It's going to be many small capillary efforts. But I think really that's where we need to focus our attention now on how to survive under emergency and fight. Because we have to, I mean, we are all acknowledging that this is an unstated emergency. I finally come to uh, a, a young friend, uh, Gautam Bhatia, who's actually joining us uh, from, from the UK. Uh, Gautam, how would you respond to my my question, is this the darkest moment in our journey of our recovery? I, I think I, I'm actually going to, um, I think, follow up on on some of the points that Nandini made. And, and I agree with her in, in taking a slightly more qualified um, approach to this question. Of course, I'm coming at this from my perspective as someone who is engaged with um, the constitution, constitutional law and, and the judiciary in the last few years. And so I think the first question really is um, when you ask, is this the darkest time uh, with regard to freedom, freedom for whom? Um, and, uh, and when you begin to, I think, um, probe a little deeper into that question, um, you do find that there has been, what I would say, a, an unfinished project of decolonization in the sense that um, at the time of independence, decolonization was partial at best. Um, it was something that wasn't extended to significant parts of the country. And I, I don't mean in terms of, of socioeconomic um, guarantees and social upliftment, but just very basic uh, civil and, and political rights, rights of citizenship. Um, large parts of the country didn't have representative government for at least 20 years um, after independence and many other things like that. Um, and so, uh, so for, for many years and even continuing to this day, uh, there hasn't really been a complete decolonization. Um, and what we see today as a dark moment for freedom, I think, is is what is something that we see as as even an erosion of the gains that were made. That's I think what what the fear is. But just to uh, specify a little bit more on that, so I mean, if you look at some of the the really important issues right now, let's take for example the incarceration of dissenters, activists, protesters under law, such as the UAPA. Now the UAPA has a very very long lineage. Um, just this basic idea that uh, that you cannot get bail um, if there is a prima facie case against you, which in this case literally just means the police version. So you cannot get bail as long as the police version is simply internally consistent, no matter how persuasive or how true it is. And so you stay in jail until the end of, of, of your trial. Uh, that has been a staple feature of, of Indian laws from pre-colonial, uh, pre-independence times carrying forward into, uh, into independent, independent India and taking different forms in different, in, different, um, uh, in different ways, different laws. There was an original UAPA, there was the TADA, there was the POTA, and now there is the new UAPA. And uh, when we talk about the judiciary and the judiciary's recent collapse um, into the executive, uh, these laws have been consistently upheld uh, over time. Uh, so, you know, we have this whole, um, this whole idea that the ADM Jabalpur case in the emergency was the nadir of the Supreme Court where it completely gave into the executive. If you actually read the ADM Jabalpur case closely, what you find is that the judges in the majority marshal a whole range of, of judgments of pre-independence courts 
and post independence quotes all of which have consistently held um, that when there is an emergency the courts no longer can no longer intervene and there were emergencies during the chi- the war with china and so on in the 60s we had judgments back then that pretty much hold exactly what the adm jabalpur case does but they don't form part of a you know lexicon because the emergency occupies for good reason that level of space uh, in our, in our in our historical landscape uh, so so something like the uapa has deep antecedents that go uh, far far back um, and uh, and so if we if we are to contest what's happening today i think the first thing is to acknowledge um, that uh, the problems we face have very old roots um, not only do they have old roots but in many ways they are sanctified by the same constitution that we uh, stand upon when we protest and when we dissent uh, marx had this very famous phrase when he was examining the 1848 french constitution where he says that every constitution has its own negation contained within it uh, that's true for our constitution as well in provisions that explicitly authorize detention um that that provide for wide ranging restrictions on fundamental rights that in various places have phrases like notwithstanding anything contained in this constitution which effectively creates a black hole um uh, and the courts have held that that means that that fundamental rights chapter is also excluded uh from consideration so if you actually read the constitution if you examine uh the moment of framing more closely um what you find is a very patchy story you find that that at the moment at which it may have been possible to decolonize completely the efforts were not only partial but also contained within them their own negation and destruction and the history of constitutional interpretation after independence has been a contested story between the constitution's emancipatory impulses and its repressive impulses and what we are seeing right now um, is the dominance of those repressive impulses but a dominance that is traced back in a continuity across the years um so what i would say therefore is that that yes it is of course a dangerous time for freedom is it uniquely dangerous i don't know because not only have there been large parts of our country which have never enjoyed constitutional freedom in true sense but also that the unfreedom we see, we see today from a civil political rights perspective a constitutional perspective um is not something that has come about in opposition to the constitution itself but draws upon constitutional terrain just a terrain that 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 is not conducive to emancipation and so i think the solution therefore again i'm i'm and this is my perspective as somebody who engages with the constitution as document as doctrine and so this is complementary to uh, other forms of resistance and protest is to begin by acknowledging that the constitution itself allows so much of this and to then ask ourselves uh what might a, an emancipatory constitutionalism as practice look like well that's that's uh that's uh, that's that's really uh, interesting and valuable uh i think you what you reminded us is that uh there segments of our people who never enjoyed even the civil and political freedoms that we speak about let alone freedom from want uh, uh the social and economic freedoms uh that the present moment uh, is really uh, has roots in failures contained within the constitution itself and 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 in in the practice that has followed i think these are sobering reminders uh, uh even as we look look at this moment uh i still would you know uh, before i come to my second question i still have one uh question i i do know if if we still had had a moment where uh where we had a government which was using its unfreedom so clearly uh to destroy uh you know uh, as a communal project as a you know where where, where you were using your unfreedom uh not just to remain in power but to advance uh, uh, uh an alternative you know imagination of this country itself that i think makes this moment more dangerous just just for your consideration i mean that's that's something that i wanted to lay out i don't see uh, i see the misuse of, of of authority and power for both for uh, remaining in 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 power and for the advancement of crony capitalism but not for 
the subversion of the very idea of a country of equal citizenship, uh, equal and humane citizenship. I mean, that I think is what makes, to me, this moment the most dangerous uh, so far. Um, the second question, and you know, uh, in the second round, uh, you could respond both to this observation of mine and to a, a very specific one, uh, which is the pandemic itself. Uh, and uh, and we're seeing, uh, uh, I, I wrote in a piece in the Hindu a couple of days back that we're seeing an invisible humanitarian crisis. Uh, it's, it's, you know, that we're seeing levels of mass hunger uh, and unemployment uh, and suffering, uh, perhaps greater than in, in, in the last half century in its scale and depth. Uh, and yet it doesn't seem to be uh, anyone's uh, sort of anxiety or concern. Uh, as Kiruba said, many other things seem to be pre preoccupying both the government, but also the media and also the uh, middle class discourse. Uh, but I wanted to also reflect on whether all of this is not caused by the virus. It's caused by public policy choices that have been made uh, in response to the virus. So have, you know, have the public policy choices that have been made consistently uh, in relation to the pandemic itself uh, also robbed us of our freedoms? Not what they, not, not what they did alongside, but in, it, in, the, in the response to the health emergency itself, uh, did that uh, in, in, in many ways, uh, destroy our freedom. So I have two questions and I go back to the group. I thought I'd go in reverse order this time. Uh, so Gautam, would you like, like to come back to you? I think on the, on the, uh, on the, on the issue, on the second round of questions on the issue of, of the pandemic um, and, and the undemocratic uh, character of, of addressing it that we've seen. Um, so there are two or three things that I think are worth uh, flagging. And the first is that the constitutional scheme of rests upon a decentralization of power, not only vertically between different levels of government, but also horizontally. So the idea always is that, that you try and avoid the concentration of power in any one body by distributing it among various branches of the state that, that answer to different kinds of institutional logic. Um, so at the very simple level, you have parliament, executive, and courts, parliament frames law, um, executive implements it, and the courts check for its constitutional validity. Uh, in, in parliamentary democracies, there is, in general, a blurring between parliament and the executive. So that's a, a feature of parliamentary democracies. Yeah, yeah. But there still is a separation. I think that, that uh, over the last, again, this is, and again, I think I'm sure this is not something new. Over the last 20 or 30 years, there's been um, I think a shift towards what in the US they call the imperial presidency, which is that the other branches of the state begin to lose relevance as the executive begins to encroach upon their, their spheres and, and they're unable to resist. Again, if you look at the constitution, seeds of this are contained in the constitution and the institutions of governors, ordinance making powers and so on. Um, the pandemic has put this in particularly stark relief um, because first of all, the government chose not to declare a formal emergency. A formal emergency would require ratification by parliament after a certain amount of time. Um, instead, they invoked the Disaster Management Act. Um, and once the act had been invoked, it effectively took parliament out of the equation. So after that, the pandemic has been managed, so to say, through decree, uh, executive decree. And the state governments have replicated that in their respective states by invoking the Epidemic Diseases Act. Uh, the only state that uh, went the other way was Kerala, but even Kerala passed an ordinance. Uh, so it's not as if the Kerala assembly met, it, it, the, the state government passed an ordinance. Uh, and so, so parliament is out of the equation. There's no scrutiny and even parliamentary committees were out for a long time. And so effectively you had the rule, you had, you had rule by decree. So it was a top down rule by decree that was coming from the executive. In this situation, the role of the courts becomes even more important uh, because one of the three bodies has been taken out of the equation. So at least a part of its function then has to be fulfilled by the remaining body. Uh, but what you've seen is that the courts have have refused, and I would say the Supreme Court primarily, some of the high courts have actually uh, not not failed in this fashion. The Supreme Court has refused to perform its constitutional function of holding the executive to account. Um, so you, for example, your night curfew, right, the example. Now, that is a classic case of overreach, and the court has to at least ask 
this basic question that okay what are your reasons for a night curfew and if the government can't even bring out a coherent reason then it that is the very task of the court to say okay you you you're this is arbitrary state action and so so it has to be struck down um things like that right so so what we've seen is that that and this is again i think it's important to distinguish between the court stepping in and managing the pandemic and over, and and kind of you know uh, encroaching upon the state's functions nobody is calling for that but what the court does have to do is to ask whether the executive's func- acts pass the very basic tests of rationality proportionality uh you know and so on and a good example of this is the odisha high court so there was a situation where the uh, uh, odisha government basically banned all vehicles and they were confiscating vehicles um, during the pandemic and the, and the uh, their their the reason and the answer they gave in court was that look you can just walk and get your groceries and emergency items if you need to and the court then asks that uh, okay what about disabled people what about old people what about women who in certain areas may not be comfortable walking to get uh, their essential items and need vehicles and then it carves out these exceptions from that ban so you can see that a court doesn't even need to uh, start um, becoming the nrc court that was that we saw for the nrc where it starts to become the executive just some very basic questions will will lead to a fulfillment of its role which has not happened so i think that in that sense uh, the pandemic has led to a democratic deficit in the sense that there has been executive management unconstrained by the other constitutional bodies uh, and that is what is the institutional collapse that i think people have mentioned and that's something that we need to address going forward how do we uh, how do we design institutions that can withstand this kind of seemingly inevitable march towards centralization that we've seen not just in india but other places as well so nandini uh, so to you uh, as i said very quickly two two questions for all of you firstly uh, i still you know i still would say that what makes a present moment the most dangerous is that it is Uh, it is not it is a taking of our of our freedoms for uh, a communal project uh, which is contrary to uh, the very idea of uh, india uh, do you agree with that and the second is uh, is the is 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 the handling of 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 the pandemic uh, also has it reflected uh, a decline in, in dem- democratic deficits uh, i agree with you harsh that the situation is different uh, because we now have in power a uh, organization the rss which has never believed in the indian project uh, for them this is you know a 100 year move to establish a hindu rashtra which they seem to want to you know finish very fast i mean the establishment of it uh, so i think that um, you know clearly we are in a very dangerous situation as far as the project of india goes uh it's also what makes india different from other authoritarian countries because if you look at you know other countries around the world where uh you have people like erdogan or trump etc most of them are individuals who because of their charismatic power or through other reasons have managed to you know exercise uh power in this fashion however in india it's not just modi even though he is you know the most charismatic face of the whole project uh, but the rss which is actually managing things and so if modi goes there will be somebody else there'll be shah or yogi so in in a way where um in a far more dangerous situation than any other country in the world right now uh, as far as authoritarian regimes go uh, in terms of the pandemic um so yeah so just sorry to finish that i think we need to fight against the rss i mean really need to focus on that as the primary problem uh, and in a way that's also part of the lack of asli azadi because if you look at you know to go back to um, the way the constitution was framed in fact the hindu right was pretty dominant at the time of the framing you know people like k munshi or shama prasad mukherjee had far more power than a lot of other people uh, you know the socialists weren't even there the communists weren't there so these were in fact very powerful voices in the constitution and there was a lot of the congress was also you know heavily uh, influenced by the hindu right uh, so i think this is not something that is uh, unique to the rss uh, but because the roots go much deeper this is going to be a much harder long term project uh, in terms of the pandemic i think apart from you know the use of particular um acts to or the you know disaster management act or the way that governments have handled it i think what we are seeing in society is 
the use of fear and faith to actually silence and uh, you know silence all opposition silence any alternative um, check on the government's actions uh, people are you know uh, desperate for some kind of faith to rescue them for modi to be the super god who will somehow save the country and they're also scared of each other now they're scared of every you know they're scared in a way that they really have no um, political alternative to so even if you look at all the resident wealth associations locking up the gates of the colonies again like the night curfew this is something that has no logic it's not like you know the virus is going to come in driving through certain gates and not through other gates but it's a way of keeping people out establishing a siege mentality and i think that's really what this government is also counting on the fear and the faith aspect to support its uh, you know authoritarian agenda it's actually ruling by decree but also ruling by fear uh, a certain normalization of fear uh, and its mainstreaming uh, that we are seeing um but also i think the earlier point and we need to come back to that is that the true battle uh, is against the rss and what it is the rss that makes the india project actually much more dangerous than what is happening in trump uh, think of uh, a ku klux klan which is legal and uh, available and and working openly in every uh, neighborhood supporting mr trump's politics and what would that have made mr trump i think that we need to recognize uh, that danger and when we speak in the third round about resistance uh, that's also something that we need to bear in mind so kiruba uh, my two questions and uh, how would you respond i do agree with what uh, gautapatiya told about uh, how the government is drawing power from the constitution in fact that is a reason why dr ambedkar uh, told that he shall be the first person to burn uh, burn it out and he also believed that This constitution does not suit anybody, and he also uh, went on to say that the greatest harm will come by injuring the minorities, and that's what we are witnessing today. And I think the present BJP government, as Nandini Sundar uh, rightly pointed out, it's trying to make. I mean, the government institutions are already Brahminical, but the present BJP government is trying to uh, make structural changes in the building of Hindu nation, which cannot be. reversed by any other government even in the next 5 years or 10 years when they come to power so i think it's a clearly uh, well planned uh, you know thing and even from what tejasvi surya you know raised on the day of ayodhya ram temple foundation laying that he says the government the state power should be controlled for the sustenance of dharma so i think it's a long standing plan of the present uh, rss led bjp government to make all the states into union territories for the uh, you know better administration of governors and to make it a hindu nation and uh, this um, this sort of all hinduization saffronization is reflected in the labor laws again in the education bill and uh, uh, you know in uh, tamil nadu i think in the high court of madras lawyers were not able to uh, bring cases uh, before the courts because they had no access for internet and after a protest from march only just two weeks ago the madras high court association arranged for a internet uh, room where lawyers oh. present their cases so when uh, this is a circumstance the digital india is not uh, you know uh, not a reality and it's not accessible enough um i think um, you know the dangerous uh, danger has al- already been there and this pandemic is uh, just mul- multiplying it into uh, different levels which um, you know which has gone out of the hands because of the curfew like you said night curfew and uh, total curfew on sundays uh, kirpa I, um, I, i think you're underlining the dangers and one of the dangers actually as you're saying the union territory uh, Uh, notion that you gave i think that one of the freedoms uh, that have been crushed is also the freedoms of the state uh, to to uh, to exercise their uh, powers uh, which were uh, as imagined in the constitution itself uh, and there may be flaws as botham said in the way that that was both imagined and protected 
uh, but I think that federalism itself is also one of the, uh, you know, in a very diverse country like ours, uh, federalism is also, uh, you know, an aspect of uh, constitutional freedom itself that we need to recognize. Uh, you know, the experience of Bangladesh and, and its separation from Pakistan and the importance of of a people, uh, of their language, of their culture, of their autonomy. Uh, and that also stands in danger. Uh, Zoya, if I could come to you with your response to these two questions. I want to respond to what you have said uh, about the present conjuncture. I said I'd respond to that. Uh, I agree with you and also uh, uh, with Mandari uh, that this is, I mean, we have to recognize that what we are in is something very different from anything that has happened in the past. That there were many wrongs in the past, that there were many compromises that were made in the past is beyond, uh, is beyond doubt. But I think the, uh, the point was that we have to recognize that this is a uniquely different political conjuncture. And why is it different for the reasons that you and, uh, and Nandini have pointed out? Because this is the first time that we have a full-fledged right-wing government. Uh, even Atal Bihari Vajpayee's government was, was different because it was a coalition government. This is the first time that the BJP has formed a government with 303 seats. It's extraordinary and it, it's much more than an absolute uh, majority. Secondly, secondly, this is a government that for all practical purposes is controlled by the RSS. There is no, no getting away, uh, no getting away uh, from that. And I think so. Therefore, my point uh, uh, of agreement with you would be that while in the past uh, we can point out many compromises, but what is now underway is a programmatic. You see, one thing is pragmatic compromises. The other is a programmatic attempt to establish an authoritarian Hindu state. I don't think the issue is just a communal project. It goes beyond that. It is actually the establishment of an authoritarian Hindu state. That is what is underway. And that is what will threaten democracy. That is what will threaten uh, equal rights uh, and equal uh, citizenship. And surely the compromises of the past pale in comparison with the political actions of the present. And I think there are two or three issues which again make our response to this so much more difficult. One is that, you know, I mean, we, we don't often discuss the party system. I mean, if we compare, let us say, uh, America, the US and India, I mean, look at the response to the Trump administration and his excesses from the media, from the institutions as well, from the party system. Now, our party system is very different. It's so fragmented that it leaves very little, little possibility of a united opposition to, uh, I mean, to authoritarianism or to this uh, government. Secondly, I think, and I feel that this is a major issue and this in a way affects all of us, is that I think we simply do not recognize what we are up against. We seem to treat this as any other, uh, any other political party, as any other, uh, as any other government. And we keep on saying that, that when all this has happened before, now, if all of this has happened before, there's very little reason for us then to be worked up about it, or to be upset about it, or to organize and protest against it, because presumably this moment will pass. Because after all, all such uh, dark moments, and as a lot of people seem to think that there's, there's continuity, I want to emphasize that there is a fundamental discontinuity between the present and the past. And until and unless we recognize the discontinuity, I do not think for those of us who are really interested in resistance against this, we are not going to get uh, get very far. Now, to your, uh, to the question that you have circulated about uh, the pandemic, uh, well, I mean, much has already been said, so I don't want to really uh, repeat that, except to say that uh, it's significant that this whole COVID-19 you know, crisis, which is disrupting uh, global politics, happened at a time when democracy, as I think Kruva pointed out, and perhaps uh, Nandini also pointed out, at a time when democracy was already under stress and under assault in 
in many parts, uh, many parts of the world. This virus provided an opportunity to several leaders to accumulate unparalleled powers uh, as part of their attempt to contain the spread of, of the virus. So interestingly, on the one hand, the virus strengthened you know, the regimes of leaders like Orban or uh, Duterte in the Philippines or uh, Erdogan, for example, in, in Turkey. And on the other, it has uh, skewed the relationship or the power relation between governments and citizenry in favor of the former in countries which are not as authoritarian as Turkey, Philippines, and so on, such as, for example, India or uh, the United States. So, uh, so I think this is important. the context in which this uh, outbreak, I mean, this COVID outbreak happened is important. And, and, it, uh, and the pandemic can uh, amplify the ability of political leaders to craft authoritarian measures more justifiably, so to speak, to deal with this, uh, to deal with this uh, crisis. And I need not go into all, all that has been done by way of consolidation of power by, uh, by authoritarian leaders or even by uh, uh, democratic or populist leaders in curbing individual liberties, respecting uh, the space for civil society and so on. Now in India, I think uh, uh, in India since March, 25, uh, March 25th, when the first nationwide lockdown was announced, and until now, I think it is significant that the virus curve hasn't flattened. In fact, the caseload as we speak, is rising steadily. And the official toll of 45,000 deaths is fairly high, even though, uh, you know, the government and its spokesmen remind us every day uh, that, uh, that the fatality rate in India is not high compared to, uh, compared to other countries. And I think the significant point is that when, this, uh, when uh, the severity of the pandemic hasn't really uh, subsided, but the political costs and consequences of this complete lockdown on democratic rights have been very high. And I would say, the, I would just say, put it very briefly, uh, that I think the, uh, the consequences from the standpoint of democracy and democratic freedoms can be grouped under three subheads. One, the state-led subversion of rights and liberties. Two, the exposure of disadvantaged and vulnerable populations to unprecedented economic hardship, and three, the suppression of information through curves on media and on the dissemination of uh, inter uh, intervention. And, the th and we can see the consequences. First of all, uh, a point that I think has already been made, that it bears uh, being underlined here, that the COVID scare put an end to the most remarkable uh, protests that India has witnessed ever, which was the protest against the CAA. After the outbreak uh, of the pandemic, the government moved in very quickly, it acted very uh, swiftly uh, to remove the sit-in uh, protests, of course, in Shahinbal and Lucknow and in, uh, in many other, Bhopal and so on, and so on and so forth. Uh, and, and of course, uh, as significantly, the government went against and after activists who participated in this movement and has gone on to arrest so many of them who were associated with this. Second, I think this draconian lockdown, perhaps the most stringent lockdown anywhere in the world, and as you said, for example, China, uh, at any point in time, uh, only 5% uh, of its population was affected, whether it was 100% in India, and for weeks on end, it was not as though this lockdown lasted for three weeks, as the Prime Minister had initially uh, announced. It went on for, I mean, for nearly, uh, nearly uh, two months. And even though we are on lockdown now, there's still so many restrictions uh, that are still in, uh, still in place. So we are far from normality, uh, so to speak. Uh, so I think the, this draconian lockdown that was imposed uh, at this four hours notice, which did not happen in any other part of the world, has clearly widened uh, inequality in the past, gender, and religious divides in India, which anywhere in the region 
in discrimination and inequalities. I mean, we are, we are a world leader when it comes to discrimination and uh, inequalities. And then the pandemic on, on top of that, as I said, aggravated and exacerbated those, uh, those divides and inequalities. And I think uh, nothing demonstrates that, uh, demonstrates that more than the condition of thousands of migrant workers who we all saw working hundreds of kilometers on foot uh, their homes. That is perhaps the most stinging indictment of the state's apathy, and I might add, even of all of democratic indifference, if I might, uh, if, if I might put it uh, this way. And obviously, uh, the government's hurried announcement affected the livelihood of 450 million uh, workers, or perhaps even more than that, in a country where social protections are so limited unlike other countries which were uh, imposing lockdowns. Look at the social protections and also look at the way in which those countries in Europe, I mean, we have imitated Europe and so on in imposing lockdown, but we are certainly not imitating those countries and providing the kind of social and re relief packages that those countries have, uh, have provided by way of cash transfers, by way of salaries, by way of so much social support. In countries which already have social security, and, and in addition to that, governments have announced huge uh, relief, uh, relief uh, packages, whereas our uh, relief package, the less said about it, the uh, less said about it, the better. And then I think, uh, uh, I mean, a point that has already been made, and I, uh, I don't want to really relate uh, it, that is the muzzling of, of the critical media and the point that I think Truba made in her opening remarks, which is suspension of labor laws, which, is, which has really to do with the pandemic. Uh, it's really very serious, and it's very clear that several state governments took advantage of the pa pandemic. Of course, the leader in all this has to be the, my, the state of UP, which took the lead. Followed by, of course, many other uh, many other uh, uh, state governments as well. They were quick to dismantle uh, protection for uh, uh, for laws. But interestingly, the pandemic hasn't stopped. I mean, while all of this was being done, the pandemic hasn't stopped the government from going ahead with major policy initiatives like the national uh, education policy, uh, the giving approval for the Central Vista project. We must not forget that that all this is has happened now, and of course, not to speak of the of the grand uh, Bhumi Puja for the grand uh, Ram Temple. So I think all together then, clearly, uh, I mean, there are two sides uh, to this, uh, to this uh, uh, pandemic, which is uh, two sides to it, which is to say how governments have used this uh, to introduce uh, even democratic governments in this system, authoritarian uh, uh, to enhance executive power, and on the other hand, going ahead with, uh, with policies without any discussion. I mean, imagine uh, the national education policy. I mean, it's just been discussed on, I mean, there have been two or three panel uh, discussions on television the day it was announced, but with very little possibility of mobilization against against this policy. I mean, or at least a discussion before, before even uh, thinking of protesting against it. Um, Satish, finally, uh, for the second round, uh, may I come to you uh, with your response to both questions? I, I think uh, the question we can legitimately ask is whether the handling of the pandemic was done in a democratic, with a democratic sensibility. Uh, I think some amount of coercion cannot be avoided in dealing with situations like pandemic. So talking about procedural democracy in the, in, in the context of a pandemic may not be very useful. There are very important questions to be asked about it, but I think we get uh, confused uh, when we are also talking at the same time of uh, questions of Azadi and uh, you know so on. So in my opinion, they, they should be talked about differently. Uh, coming to your question about uh, communalism and whether we have had this kind of a regime before, um, I think once again, the, um, the very term communalism uh, means something to us and it, which it does not mean to large numbers of others. And uh, we have our, uh, the language that we used to speak of communalism and things like this, uh, its power or its effectiveness was largely an inherited effectiveness. It was not something I feel that 
we as users of that language had actually helped to build on the ground. And we, now that inherited sort of capital, if you want to put it crudely, the, the capital inherited from uh, Mahatma Gandhi as a persona uh, has in a sense uh, lost its value. Uh, and we have to forge a new language which will um, have a have purchase on, on our current reality. And um, just as examples, until we, this is an analogous example, it's not exactly the same thing. Communism is not the same thing as dealing with demonetization or uh, the migrant labor uh, long marches that we saw recently. But I feel that until we have a language that can make sense of events like demonetization, causing widespread destruction to lives and yet not bringing about any political opposition uh, of, of, any, of any size. Um, and similarly, the, uh, these um, uh, migrant workers walking hundreds of kilometers home uh, saying, uh, what a great job uh, Modi Sahib had done. Uh, until we understand these phenomena, until we have a language that understand these phenomena, I think even on the question of communalism, uh, we will, um, you know, we will uh, be ineffective as, as as we are today. You know, the third uh, round actually, uh, the question that I had planned to ask uh, uh, converges with a, a number of questions from the audience as well. So let me uh, read out what I was going to ask, but then also bring in uh, a number of perspectives that have come in from the audience on on this, which is largely about resistance. How do you think that we, the people of India, need to, what we need to do to prevent India from its decline into an illiberal democracy, which is hostile uh, to, uh, uh, to its minorities? Uh, we, uh, we also have uh, a, a range of, uh, as I said, uh, other questions that have, have been raised in the chats. Uh, uh, what, what one uh, is is uh, that, uh, what are the possible avenues to resist? This is from Vandana Srivastava. While there are a number of people currently supporting the present government, as stated by Professor Deshpande, we may be surprised by the number of people wanting a change. To put it mildly. The NPR protests took many of us by surprise. That does give us some hope. Uh, and, 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 and there are other, uh, a few other people who've asked about, uh, most of the uh, opposition parties have not been vocal about the acts of the government, which go against democracy. Would it be realistic to expect from them at this juncture uh, uh, to, to lead us in, in, in any resistance? And how do we work without them if, if, if they're not going to be there? Uh, uh, and another, Hina has asked, how do you see the freedom to protest in the time of pandemic when online protests are being organized, uh, but whereas mass mobilization still influenced by the Gandhian era of mass movement uh, doesn't seem possible? Um, Noor has asked, uh, don't you think there should be a network of WhatsApp and social media groups flooded with fact checks, peace committees of responsible citizens, collection of video evidence, justice forums? Civil so society alone can shorten this curve of human suffering. It will continue as long as politicians find it electorally beneficial. Uh, and there are many other questions of the same, uh, on the, on the same, uh, of, of, of the same tenor. Uh, largely, how do we resist in these times? Uh, both in the context of uh, uh, the restrictions on our movement uh, because of uh, the lockdown and, and the pandemic, uh, but also uh, in, in the larger context of, uh, of a significant popular support uh, by, uh, by significant sections of our people uh, for these policies and uh, the, scene, the failure of the political establishment. I think those are the questions I, I, I could make out. Uh, so, uh, so let me sort of uh, change the order again. Uh, uh, maybe, uh, Nandini, would you like to start? You know, there are many things that need to be done. Um, there are many 
people who are much more qualified than I am because they've been doing some of these things like Harsh has been working on the ground to change things. So, you know, you'd have a much better sense of uh, how to go about it. Uh, but let me just give you my wish list of how we should proceed, right? This is clearly not um, something that is necessarily going to happen. One is I think the left party should all come together and they should issue a mass membership drive and we should all join the left because the left uh, parties are the only parties right now who are supporting the constitution. Okay. On the Ram Mandir question on Kashmir, they were the only ones who've taken an unambiguous stand. Uh, the DMK also has taken a good stand on Kashmir. Um, but every other party has been compromised. And I think these are the two um, issues which clearly show up where you stand on the constitution. Uh, so I think um, I don't trust any other political party. And I think we really need the left to get its act together as a political party and start thinking about how it can win elections and fight on the ground, not just, you know, be a little. Um. Secondly, clearly there's a problem of money. The BJP, the RSS has out moneyed everybody in terms of the kind of money that they're getting and the fact that they're closing up everybody, closing off everybody else's avenues of funding. So that's something that we really need to think about how to, you know, get enough to uh, resist. Uh, thirdly, um, and I think, you know, maybe we should all start, um, for those of us who can afford it, sort of keeping aside a set amount of our salaries, because this is that moment of crisis when really you need to act in an organized uh, fashion. Uh, thirdly, um, I think uh, we need to provide an alternative narrative um, and there have to be a lot of young people who are savvy with the media, savvy with different kinds of ways of speaking, who have to get involved in that. And the CA, anti-CA protests were a great moment for that. And, you know, we have to abandon fear. I think that's the most important thing that we have to somehow, uh, and I succumb to it all the time as well, this kind of uh, especially with the pandemic, you know, chalo, okay, when the pandemic gets over, I will start getting active kind of feeling. So that's something that we all feel and we're also all scared, especially with now what's happening in Delhi and uh, the mass arrest. But, you know, there has to be a way of keeping an alternative language going and develop it further. Fourth, we need to start, um, you know, doing what the RSS has been doing all this time, which is something that we've forgotten, actually going out there, talking to people, uh, you know, house by house, setting up small institutions. So there's going to be no simple way of doing this. Uh, there has to be a variety of different ways, but we have to take this threat seriously. We are in a situation of fascism and, uh, you know, possibly there's no way of counteracting it uh, through any other way, and, but we can't hope for World War II to come and rescue us. Uh, that's not going to happen. So, uh, you know, we have to start acting wherever we can. Thanks. Kiruba, uh, your, your wish list about how do we resist? Yeah. Uh, with no offense, I think the first tip is to realize that e-protesting or digital media campaigning is not going to help. As a person who has been on the ground, I strongly believe mobilization of masses is going to bring a productive or it, it could be uh, you know more productive than hashtagging uh, sitting somewhere in abroad and the second step is that i think uh, i disagree with nandini sundar because the left party supported ews reservation and they also supported ayodhi uh, ram and thing and we as dalits and marginalized sections we don't trust left parties anymore i i can trust dmk but i can't trust communist party of india there is so much of um, uh, you know, discussions and debates that have to be made. And also, I think all this protest should be led by the Brahmin elite upper caste oak liberals. And we Dalits are not going to sacrifice our lives anymore. We have already been fighting for our livelihood. We have already been fighting for our survival. And uh, all the upper caste oak liberals, they think if uh, there is a protest near the India Gate or near the beach, they would come. But for a CEA protest that's been happening in a um, you know, Muslim neighborhood or in Islam, they won't participate. So their protest model itself is something which is more elite and which is not connected to the ground reality. So I think this has to be uh, brought into consideration. And also the other thing is uh, about who is setting the agendas of uh, this protest. For instance, CAA was led by 
Muslim women, and it was one of the most powerful protests in the recent times. But still, a Brahmin woman called Gayatri was the focus of the entire arrest thing when she draw a column in Chennai and she was arrested. There were many other Muslim women, Muslim activists who were arrested, but the entire agenda was set by these people. And there was a press meet here where many people were disappointed, but because the entire press meet was not about CAA, but about a Brahmin woman getting arrested. So this sort of layers has to be addressed promptly and the uh, upper caste elite both liberals should fight on our behalf. They should lead things and they should sacrifice their privileges and then the people at the margins will join together and let's take this protest forward. And I honestly you know, appreciate the efforts of people who have been trying to protect the democracy and the constitutional rights we have been uh, fighting for and also Wherever I talk to my community, I talk about how constitution is interpreted in, in a very different ways that is not uh, being meant for. And also how uh, Ambedkar wanted to burn the constitution and how a constitution is not a only protective instrument that we have at our hands. So we should have the understanding that uh, constitution is not our holy book. It's not the holy grail. And it is also was, uh, you, you know, uh, made for the benefit of the ruling class, Brahmin ruling class. So this sort of nuanced understanding of the reality and coming together with, uh, with more uh, acknowledging, more understanding and acknowledgement of privileges and underprivileges and giving way for uh, leadership for marginalized communities like we did give leadership for Muslim women in the CAA protest would be the only way that we could take this fight forward. So great. Uh, so leadership uh, for uh, oppressed people uh, themselves with solidarity from people of privilege. Uh, 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 but you were saying also, uh, and Gautam, that's why I thought I'll come to you, uh, holding the constitution in one hand, but also challenging it uh, in the other as part of our resistance. So what thoughts do you have about resistance at this moment, Gautam? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm going to defer to what the others have said because, you know, my, my primary work is is in institutions and institutions are not in the best of shape right now. Uh, so, so, uh, so, so I, 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 I'm going to defer on that on, on the broader point. Uh, I just, what I'll just say is that I think that, that I think it's correct um, to, to, appro to, to take um, a, 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 a critical view towards the, the constitution as an instrument or as, as a terrain on which power is negotiated. Um, and so I think, so while I think it's, it's very important, um, mm -hmm. I, I, I found it moving and important that the CAA protests took the form of constitutional language and especially the preamble, uh, because the preamble, I think the beauty of the preamble is it's universalist in its scope. Um, and, and so it's something you can adopt for yourself, uh, no, no matter who you are, because of the principles that it, it lays down. Uh, so I think that was, that was important. Uh, and at the same time, I think as, as, as Kiruba has said, and, and as, as I tried to, to, to say in my initial remarks, once you get into the nitty gritties of the constitution, what, what you find is that, that it has repressive and emancipatory impulses that are in conflict. And uh, the manner in which it has been uh, implemented over time has been uh, such that the repressive impulses have gradually uh, almost you know, um, overshadowed its emancipatory impulses. And so I think that that um, that a, a resistance, a vocabulary of resistance that uncritically um, rests on the constitution, is a is a problem because even if such a resistance movement was to prevail, it would risk reproducing the same problems that that con that confront us right now only in different gazes, uh, in different in different guise. Uh, and so I think my limited contribution here would be that that um, that a vocabulary of resistance has to take a critical approach towards the constitution and ask itself uh, in, in what ways has the constitution actually been a repressive document um, and in what ways can we can we reimagine a constitutional framework um, that would avoid those pitfalls and of course as, as Kiruba said the leadership there would would should should be from those people who have borne the brunt of the constitution's repressive impulses Thank you, Kiruba and, and Gautam on this. I, I, I must say that I, well, I, well, I completely agree in principle. I worry at this moment because I feel that we have our backs to the wall uh, with a regime that is hostile to the emancipatory elements of the constitution itself. 
But if you open up a, a discourse in the public domain, uh, which questions uh, the constitution, we might not, uh, we, we might not amend the, uh, the repressive elements, but we might actually lose the emancipatory elements at this point of time. I mean, just uh, it's a worry that 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 that, that I that I carry. Um, Zohar, can, can, I, can I just can I just like briefly come back on that because it's, yes, you know yes. it's a fear that I've heard many times and I think it, it you know I think it's to address that. Uh, I, th I think I think it's a very valid concern and and that's why I think that that at least uh, for me and this is just speaking for myself, um, I'm not advocating kind of a. a Abandon, abandon the constitution, you know, uh, you know, approach. I, I, I wouldn't, uh, that, 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 I think it's careful to distinguish that. I think, I think what is concerning me is that if we limit, uh, if we limit ourselves to an uncritical resting upon the constitution, then even if that movement is to succeed, uh, it, it, it's, its success will lay the seeds of its own, of its own failure. Um, which is why I think that that uh, that now that we do, as you said, backs against the wall, we do have a chance to reimagine things in a more fundamental way than before. Uh, it's actually a good chance to, to do that without uh, abandoning the anchor of the constitution. I'm sorry, Harsh, I would like to make a small comment. I mean, to take a short break, briefly. I mean, uh, you know, I do believe uh, in the constitutional values and I, as a lawyer practicing in the constitutional course, I... Uh, look for reliefs through constitution. So I'm not against constitution in any, any manner, but there is a notion prevailing in the Dalit communities that constitution is drafted by Dr. Ambedkar and it is a, uh, you know, super protective instrument. And, you know, they think when the constitution is existing, we are protected enough. We don't have to protest against anything. And even if BJP is trying to dilute it through different amendments or through various amendments, we still believe in the spirit of the constitution. So I think this critical uh, lens to be, you know, how this constitution can be diluted and how it can go in a way that it can't protect you anymore is more important when we are mobilizing people against a regime like, um, you know, RSS and BJP. Nandini, I think you wanted to also come in on this. Uh, yes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I think what was important was that people were reading the preamble and we can all agree on the preamble. The rest of the constitution, we may or may not agree on specifics, but I think we can certainly hold on to the spirit of that, of the preamble. And secondly, to respond to Kiruba on the left, I agree that, I mean, I'm not saying that the left is any great, uh, you know, and I know that they have betrayed people in all sorts of ways. And But I just think that uh, we do need some kind of organized um, political force, whether it's a coalition of forces, whatever it is, uh, but one needs to start getting serious about achieving political power and not just in the sense of, uh, you know, having uh, different movements and uh, it's not going to happen like that. That's of course, Nandini, that is why I added that there has to be more debates and discussion on how to come together as uh, left movement, right? I totally stand with left parties, but I have problems with them and I appreciate them coming for discussions with other state parties like DMK and other marginalized sections. Marginalized. I'm not even a party member or anything. So oh, it's I, totally agree. Agree. I totally agree. We have problems, but they are, they are the ones who have at least raised their voice at this moment yeah. and they should give them with hope. Uh, you know, the preamble, uh, just, just to finish up on that point, because I was in protest actually almost every day in some corner of the country and, uh, you know, could not hold back my tears when 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 a young girl would sit stand up and read uh, the preamble and people would repeat after it and when you say some of those words in in hindustani for instance they just have a different resonance so insaf justice uh, azadi liberty e equality barabari samanta uh, uh, fraternity bandhuta you know, they they mean something they resonate somewhere and i think people you know, people really know that that is the imagination of a country that we need to uh, need to hold on to. So I think holding on to the preamble is maybe how, what we need to say, and and, and but look at, but critically view uh, other elements uh, of, of of the specific details. Zoya, you're a political scientist as well. Okay, uh, so my wish list is uh, consists of five five elements. One, I think, we need to continue the struggles and protests in defense of equal rights, uh, which were embodied in the anti-CA protests. And hopefully we can move from online 
action and online uh, protest to on ground uh, protests as is happening in many other countries despite lockdowns i think we you know we uh, we understand that things here are different but nonetheless look at this uh, protests that are happening in so many parts of the world and i think we have something to learn from the black lives protests in america i think we would do well to really uh, really uh, study that and learn some lessons uh, learn some lessons from that um the second uh, second point is um but you know i mean i'm not uh, denying that there is a considerable public support for the present regime and particularly the leader of this uh, government i mean there's no no denying uh, the popularity of prime minister narendra modi but at the same time i think we must not forget that 62% people did not vote for the bjp and prime minister modi despite an extraordinary campaign that he had, had mounted in 2019 uh, and despite the fact that the focus was on national security after the balakot air strikes and yet 62% uh, yet they got 38 37.5% of the vote now this is something which is significant before we uh, you know before we sort of uh, get very uh, pessimistic my third point is that uh the opposition must unite the left should unite most definitely but the left uniting is not going to take us very far i mean sad i mean i feel it breaks my heart to say this but the fact of the matter is that the left is not a significant force and ours is an electoral democracy and in an ele- electoral democracy we need obviously political parties who, which have have electoral support left electoral support right now is really speaking limited to kerala and that is about it not even west bengal as was the case in the past so therefore i think what we need is opposition unity and what we need is a united front against uh, against the present regime and i think france the example of france is very very instructive uh, you know in france uh, most political parties just about all political parties united against marine le pen in 2017 all uh, parties in france uh, supported emmanuel macron in order to stop um, marine le pen Uh, in the second round of the presidential elections in France now that is because they recognize the dangers posed by somebody like uh, you know a far right leader like uh, Marine Le Pen now clearly the present uh, i mean our presently a leader popular as he might be is certainly belongs to the far right and therefore we need the same kind of unity here I mean, the same kind of opposition uh, opposition unity uh to take on uh, take on uh, take on the government and my first point is that i think uh, civil society has to work with political bodies i agree with um with nandini i mean civil society is extremely important and the kind of work civil society is doing is is important but ultimately in an electoral democracy parties count and there is really no alternative to a party based and to a party based uh, democracy and therefore i think civil society has to work with parties to strengthen uh, strengthen the opposition against this government so, uh, opposition unity is, is what civil society needs to struggle for uh, is what zoya tells us satish your wish list for resistance and for change Uh, thank you thank you ash i i have um, i'm happy to go along with everybody's wish list so far uh, because i i don't really have uh, anything substantial to add to that what i'm interested in really is modalities whatever it is we do how do we go about doing it and uh, there are two elements that i would like to emphasize there one is what i think already mentioned by one or two others including uh, nandini we have to operate at the level of the everyday there's a sense in which protest in in inverted quotes becomes um, something special something exceptional uh, in our language and whether we are conscious of it or not we tend to romanticize it slightly uh, and we need to get away from that and uh, start thinking uh, in the in the rss mode 
of of the everyday of a long drawn out continuous thing uh, the second thing which is equally important and uh, this refers a lot to what cuba has been reminding us um, uh, so so effectively whatever we do must be infused with a new sense of self reflexivity of attention to what we sound like to others who we are what we what we represent to others uh, there is a, there is an over easy sense in which we have people like us particularly those privileged by uh, class and caste and so on uh, have uh, have uh, tended to assume that we are representatives and that we speak for uh, you know the people of india or other such phrases uh, i would like i would want all of us to be uh, a little little wary of using phrases like the people of india and so on when we speak and uh, we need to be very very conscious of uh, who we are and what we sound like to others it's only when we speak to others not for others uh, that i i feel we can we can get ahead but in terms of actually what is to be done i'm very happy to go along with the other panelists and their lists so thank you i think uh, uh, you know just before we close uh, one round of last comments uh, just a, a minute or two each uh, about uh anything that you feel we need to take away from this discussion uh, satish why don't we start with you no i just wanted to thank you i mean um, we are i know we all feel that this is less than something else but if this is what we can do we should do this and uh, it's important to survive this phase there are times where you just need to last out we just need to endure this is one of those and we should help each other do it thank you that was lovely uh, uh, kirupa would you what would you like to so what i may say might amount to suggestion but still i think yeah. things will definitely change and uh, oppressed classes have always raised against any uh, you know the sort of uh, very uh, fascist regimes so i'm very optimistic that all the oppressed classes will come together and they'll fight this uh, fascist government but it is quite possible only with the solidarity of people who have uh, voices in the uh, you know institutional level and in the policy making and also in different places so unless they realize their contribution in making this country more democratic our fight it's going to end up with more blood and you know more bodies so it's on the hands of the uh, upper caste upper class folk liberals how uh, you know how far they uh, want to take this protest in a non violent manner but do you feel hopeful kiruba of course of course we have already been fighting you know mm-hmm. uh, we have been for, fighting for our survival we have been fighting for a livelihood i as a lawyer have been fighting for 11 years just for my recognition and look at the muslim communities they have been crushed like anything but still they have or uh, you know rose up against uh, this uh, caa and we oppressed communities are always willing and we are always ready to come to the streets and of course and that's why i keep reiterating that we are going to bring uh, you know true uh, independence to this nation but do you want to participate in it do you want to benefit out of it it's your choice very well very nice he said gautam i agree with everything that's been said before and uh, at, at, at times like this i just remember there's, there's a wonderful line by by tony ben the the former uh, the late british mp where he said that there is there is no final defeat just as the, just as there is no final victory so i think that's something worth worth remembering uh, at all times okay uh, zoya well i think i want to thank you for organize this it's been a wonderful uh, discussion and i hope we have more and i certainly hope that we meet, as i said earlier move from online uh, online action to street uh, action secondly i i certainly hope that we will work for the united front against fascism and thirdly i think fascism as you know lives and thrives on fear and so some we have to really fight Here, so to speak, because that is what is preventing, uh, preventing our uh, public action. That is what is preventing protests. So I think also, but I remain hopeful, and I, and I do think that the basic issue really 
uh, in, in North India and North Western India. I do not think that the rest of the country is, is so invaded or colonized by this communal or Hindu uh, thinking. No doubt the BJP have found a near permanent home in North India, and that gives them a huge uh, political constituency. But I mean, but I think India is not just UP and Rajasthan and uh, Madhya Pradesh. India is Tamil Nadu, Karnataka, Kerala, uh, and so I'm surely there are possibilities of organizing and you know, resisting this uh, onslaught. Thank you. And Sundar, uh, Nandini? Yeah, I'd just like to uh, thank you, Harish, and uh, thank the other panelists. And um, I mean, like everyone else, I'm hopeful. Um, we don't have any alternative but to hope. So thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, all of you. Uh, uh, I mean, your presence and your words, I think this is a moment where, you know, locked up in many different ways. Uh, there's, uh, you know, and, and seeing an event like uh, the Ram Mandir uh, extravaganza a few days ago, uh, you know, the, you know, when hope seems begins to look fragile, it is important for us to come together. I think these conversations uh, are valuable. They're expressions of uh, solidarity uh, and in the end hope. Uh, I, I start somewhere had said, uh, you don't fight fascism because you will win. Uh, you will fight, you have to fight fascism because it is fascism. And I think that's the beginning point. And whatever happens, we have to continue to resist. Uh, there's also Martin Luther King who said uh, that uh, the arc of history is long, but in the end it bends towards justice. How long it will be, we, we, we will need to see together. And lastly, something that got me into trouble and why the Delhi police claim, wants to lock me up uh, is something that I said to the students in Jamia, which was, I said, in the end, I don't think this is going to be resolved. It's the question of what kind of country we want to leave to our children. It won't be resolved in, in parliament, uh, Zoya said, but I, I still worry about our political opposition. It won't be resolved by the courts. Uh, it will be resolved by we, we the people. In, in, in their fullness and as Kiruba uh, says, it, it, by, by oppressed people and by people of privilege standing in solidarity uh, with humility with them. But most of all, I think it is going to be uh, resolved in ha our hearts, your hearts and my hearts, uh, whether we've allowed both hate and fear to get colonize our hearts or whether uh, uh, love and freedom is what we what we locate in our hearts and I think that's where the ultimate resistance is. So thank you all of you uh, very much for this evening. Thank you.